Instead, we have the opportunity to make a habit of empathy, to recognize ourselves and each other. Hi, it's Edwin Rush from the Center for Building a Culture of Empathy, and I'm here with uh, Connor Wood, and he's in Boston, and I'm in uh, the Berkeley area, El Cerrito. And I found out about uh, Connor by an article he wrote called Animals and Empathy, and I sent him a, a note. And uh, so we were just going to talk about uh, him and his uh, article. So uh, thanks for uh, joining me here in this uh, dialogue, Connor. Thanks for having me. Uh, so uh, could you just introduce yourself a little bit and just kind of your kind of what your background is and Sure. Uh, my name is Connor Wood. Uh, as you said, I'm a PhD student in uh, religious studies, technically, at Boston University. Uh, I focus on the intersection of religion and science broadly, and specifically on religion and physiology and religion, medicine, and healing. Um, my previous work has been in Korean shamanism, um, and in the evolutionary study of religious phenomena. Well, that's, that's like a great background, the science and philosophy and religion. So that's kind of three different uh, kind of traditions. It sounds like you're interested in bringing together or is that Abs right? Absolutely, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I think it's very difficult to understand things without uh, crossing disciplinary boundaries. Um, so I thought maybe we just uh, talk about your article. Uh, would you like to go through it and just uh, maybe just give an outline of what your article is about? I also have it online here that I can actually show it as you're talking about it. Sure thing. And, you know, it starts off, uh, it, the title is Empathy, I mean, Animals and Empathy, and you have a picture of uh, two, I don't know what kind of animals those are, but they're hugging or... Uh, I believe, I think those are uh, prairie dogs, if I remember right. Or lemurs, or what could be lemurs? Or? Oh, no, you're right. You're definitely right. They're lemurs. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Um, so what uh, kind of got you to write this article, and what's, what's that all about? Well, uh, the website that I write for and edit is uh, scienceonreligion.org, and it is a... Um, the public face of an institution that studies religion from both a scientific and cultural perspective. So we write articles that uh, touch on things like the evolution of human social behavior, including things like empathy and compassion, as well as ritual behavior, um, belief in supernatural entities, spirits, gods, things like that. So it's a pretty big bag of things that we're interested in. And... Um, for this particular occasion, I happened to find a couple of articles that came out at about the same time in very different venues that I thought uh, would be relevant for our readers. Um, the first one was a study uh, out of, of the University of Chicago that showed for the first time that rats could be motivated to help each other uh, by empathic concern for one another. Other primates, other, other mammals like primates um, and dogs, I believe, had been shown before to uh, feel empath empathic concern for their fellows and to act on it, but that had not been shown uh, yet with rats. The other article that I found uh, was actually a news story, one of those color news stories that they kind of give in television broadcasts right before the commercial break, um, out of uh, Pocatello, Idaho. Mm -hmm in which a moose at the Pocatello Zoo, um, uh, no, not a moose, I'm sorry, an elk at the Pocatello Zoo, um, was seen kind of behaving strangely around its water dish and moving its antlers kind of into the dish and kind of pawing with its hoof in the water. Um, and nobody, no, none of the zookeepers were sure what was going on until they found that the elk had been trying to push a small marmot um, away from the edge of his water dish to the middle where he could grab it with his teeth by the scruff of the neck and like and very very carefully move it out uh, out of danger away from the water and dropped it on the ground and then kind of nuzzled it and nudged it for a little bit until the marmot got up and scampered away. So that was an interesting 
that was an interesting color story um, that is not a scientific research study and should, shouldn't be cited as such, mm -hmm. but that would at least give us some reason to think that uh, an animal like an elk can recognize signs of distress in uh, a, a, another mammal um, and act in a manner that seems that, you know, the elk was, was motivated by a, a desire to relieve whatever suffering that marmot was experiencing. Um, a, a skeptical response would, of course, be that, well, you know, the elk just didn't want the marmot in his water dish. I wouldn't really want a, a marmot in my breakfast cereal um, or any other rodent for that matter. But the fact that the moose, instead of, you know, going right to the water after getting rid of the marmot and, and happily drinking, paid attention to the marmot for a while and kind of nuzzled, nudged it with its nose and... and it seems that that kind of seems to suggest, to suggest that you know the elk was was more interested in the marmot than the water. Uh -huh. so, so these are a couple of articles and stories just about the that animals have empathy. So that was like anecdotal, and then kind of there was that scientific study uh, with the rats. And I think you mentioned uh, Gene uh, Desi. I'm not sure how to pronounce his name out of Chicago. Too, he had did, did some research with. I don't know, did he do research with rats or mice as well? Uh, yes. Um, that researcher was the uh, PI, the, pri the principal investigator for the research study on rats. Oh, um, uh-huh. Oh, so that was the same. Mm -hmm. Right. Oh, so so. If, you, if you'd like, I could describe that study a little okay, bit Okay, sure. Yeah, I'm going to go over that. So um, I, I believe it's pronounced Desity. But oh, Desity, uh-huh. Could, He's I mean, a big name in uh, research, uh, research around empathy. He's been around for quite a while. Okay. Um, I had just, I had just uh, dis discovered him through this most recent um, research article on the rats. Um, but he, uh, hopefully we'll be encountering him more. Um, well, Destiny and his colleague colleagues... Um, if it if it, his name isn't pronounced Destiny, then I'm just gonna unfortunately mispronounce Sorry, it. Sorry, yeah, I'm not sure how uh, to pronounce it either. So yeah, so he and his colleagues um, introduced pairs of unrelated rats to each other, genetically unrelated, um, and allowed them I think two weeks um, at any rate uh, a decent amount of time to kind of get comfortable and acquainted with one another. Each one of these pairs of rats. Um, and then after that uh, several week long acquaintance period to the point where the rats were acclimated um, and sort of bonded to one another, um, the researchers took one of each one of those pairs of rats and placed that unlucky rat in a, a small glass box in the middle of the larger cage. Um, Nobody wants to be put in a little box. I mean, it was so small that the rat couldn't really turn around, I think. It's just a very, very little box. Mm -hmm. And the, um, the captive rat made uh, high-pitched distress noises that we couldn't hear, um, but presumably dogs could and definitely rats could. Um, and the researchers measured those distress noises with sensitive instruments. Um, the reason that that's important is because it shows that the, rat, the, the captive rat was communicating its distress um, and that its companion rat, which it had gotten to know over the past couple weeks, um, was able to hear those calls of distress. Now, they had a control population um, that was comprised just of... Oops. Are you there? I'm. I am still here. Okay, uh, I had lost the connection. <clears throat> uh, can you see me again? Yep, we're back. Okay. So yeah, you were just saying that there was. So they they had a control uh, group, um, and. I mean, kind of in, in essence, it was uh, that 
it, they had the experiment showed that uh, that I mean the other rat that was free uh, kind of really worked hard to kind of free the other rat to kind of they were kind of picking up the ideas they picked up on the distress of the other rat and and it, it was kind of like a, it was a really big article I mean there's a lot of reprints of it and a lot of people were commenting on it because uh, it seemed to be really uh, a cleverly designed experiment that kind of like proved that the rat had like this empathic response or something like that is right that? Yeah. the the specific um kind of hinge point of the experiment was that the the animals that did that just had you know were alone in their cages and had a little empty glass boxes in the middle of their mm -hmm. cages um learned how to open the door to the glass boxes uh, about one-sixth of the time. So about a sixth of the solitary animals, just by kind of nosing around their cages and doing what rats do, eventually figured out how to open the little glass cage um, in the middle of their larger cage. The rats who had partners, who had friends, uh, whose friends were captive inside the little glass box, learned how to nudge open the door to the box um, seventy-five percent of the time, so three three out of every four of those rats, I believe. Um, uh, yeah, seventy-five percent learned how to open those doors. Yeah. So the the difference between the number of rats who had captive partners who figured out how to open the doors and the number of rats who just had empty boxes uh, in the middle of their cages uh, who learned how to open those doors just shows that the motivation for the paired rats was was probably really to release their friends. Um, well, the thing, yeah, the thing that I was kind of wanting to also explore, there, there's been a lot uh, written up about that experiment and, you know, any, anyone can go and read about it, you know, from your site and, and from the other studies. I'm kind of, if we could maybe even just switch to kind of your personal interest in empathy, like, uh, you know, something about the empathy kind of caught your attention. I'm just kind of wondering, like, hey, how did, you know, Connor, you know, personally, how did you kind of get interested in empathy? You know, what was it that kind of caught your attention about it? Sure. Well, um, boy, there's there's all kinds of, there's a lot of answers to that question. Um, one of the, one of the things that I do, the, one of the many things that I, I guess I do is the scientific study of religion. Um, so the study of why people do rituals and believe in gods and things like that from an evolutionary scientific perspective. Um, it's not as heartless as it sounds like it is. Um, or it doesn't have to be anyway, not, not the way I do it. Uh, one of the big questions for people who study how humans evolved is how it is that we got to be so empathic for each other. Um, true humans do, you know, kill and murder and rape and pillage and, you know, go into, go into Wall Street and um, uh, make millions off of the labor of others and, you know, mm -hmm. steal right. others and stuff like that. But um, we actually are really nice to each other a lot of the time. Um, on almost, I mean, really an almost surprising amount of the time if you kind of look at things through a you know, through a simple evolutionary lens in which you know, we're just out here to produce as many copies of ourselves as possible. Why, if, we're, if that's what we're here to do, why are we so nice to each other? Um, of course, there's many answers for that, and Darwin himself even hinted at this um, in his, um, his book on um, uh, the, the origin of man. Um, that, so the, 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 the question of why it is that empathy would, would develop is one that's really interesting for people who study religion because mm -hmm. religion and the rituals um, and behaviors that surround religion um, have been shown and are increasingly being shown to enhance, often enhance these empathic responses, particularly within in groups, you know, so that if you go to church with 150 people every Sunday and you all stand up and sit down at the same time and sing at the same rhythm, um, you're actually syncing up your literally your bodies with one another. Mm -hmm. um, and that creates this really powerful sort of in-group solidarity, uh, which is uh, a major part of the reason why we, uh, we think that religion um, is often correlated with greater health 
and mental well-being, uh, especially in the United States. Um, but these rituals and behaviors can even uh, affect the way people behave to people outside of their in-groups. Um, there's been some re research that shows that sync that kind of synchronous motion where you do things in the same time um, as other people um, actually enhances your empathic and your generous responsiveness to people who are even outside your your little in group or your big in group. So you're you're seeing you're kind of interested in in religion and you've seen that that uh, ritual has been kind of important to religion and you're kind of wanting to understand the kind of the nature of ritual and kind of what that's about and you're feeling that it, it seems to be connected to empathy that it's the ritual kind of gets people to mirror each other and uh, kind of synchronize with each other and create a, a, a closer bond then? Yeah, yeah. I would if it, it, I mean, it's such a complicated subject, right? Because humans are really complicated um, animals um, and spiritual beings and everything else that we are. But um, one way to think about it might be something like, um, it seems like most mammals come, come from the factory with empathic responses or the potential for empathic responses sort of built into the hardwiring. Mm -hmm. um, that probably has helped families, you know, small families of rats and mice and rabbits and humans um, feel motivated to care for their offspring and for their um, mates or partners or other related um, animals. Uh, and, they're, and, you know, in that way, they help with genetic fitness. So the more empathic you are with individuals that share your genetic code, the more you're likely to kind of win the Darwinian game because you're going to be motivated and feel empathy for and help other animals and other individuals that actually share a lot of your genes. And so even if you're not helping your, act, your own offspring, you're helping somebody else who shares so much of your genes that um, it's going to help you out in the, in the Darwinian race. Um, well, it sounds like you're kind of coming at it from the uh, the sense that everybody it, that there's this competition, survival of the fittest, kind of uh, a mode. I, I had talked to um, Franz De Waal, who kind of writes about empathy with with animals, and he says once you have the capacity for empathy, that it's kind of like an innate capacity. He said, I mean, he was talking about whales, right? A whale gets beached. Mm -hmm. And it's like suddenly the community goes out to, you know, help this whale get off the beach, right? I mean, it's not like helping the survival of any of those people to kind of develop this quality of empathy, you know, this quality of empathy. But it's like once you have the quality, it becomes just this innate uh, quality. So it seems to have, uh, it kind of goes beyond just the survival of the fittest in the sense that once you have the innate quality, that it's just is, and you kind of can apply it to animals and other people and being other, you know, beings. So, uh, so I guess I'm saying that there's kind of like this question of is is life just you know this greedy, selfish, you know, survival of the fittest, or is empathy kind of a innate quality that we're just manifesting this innate quality, and it kind of transcends survival of the fittest in a sense. Yeah, I would say, I think that one of the reasons that um, evolutionary psychology as a discipline um, is so controversial, because it is controversial, is because a lot of the people who do evolutionary psychology really do make it seem in their writings and their books like, you know, getting your genes out really is the only thing that life is about, and it's all about survival of the fittest. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, anytime somebody says that, uh, you can pretty much safely ignore them. Um, I don't. I don't think that um, that's a, a healthy or even an epistemologically justifiable way to look at life. What I think is useful, though, is to look to look at how the Darwinian process has affected us, because it really has. And um, you know, so where I was starting before was, you know, we we come like 
other other mammals with a sort of empathic response that was probably evolved because it did help us genetically. Uh -huh. But once it's there, like you said, um, we can basically, I mean, it's just there. We can do whatever we want with it, in a sense. Just like our hands, right, were evolved um, for gripping and climbing and, um, you know, hunting and spearing and things like that. But now that we have them, we play guitar, right? We, we um, play frisbee. We do all kinds of things that evolution just doesn't care about at all. Um, so there's kind of a cycle in which it's, it's like empathy is a sort of inherent block element of the human psyche and religion can kind of build on it and turn it into sort of riff on it, you know, mm -hmm. almost like a jazz musician riffing. Um, and it turns into these wildly different and exciting manifestations that are shaped by ritual, that are shaped by beliefs and mythology. And then those things go back and feed back into the Darwinian loop because we are such cultural animals that it is our cultural, our cultural environment is actually um, part of the environment that drives our fitness criteria, which means we're not just trying to fit in with nature. We actually create our nature and um, religion and empathy are part of that. Mm -hmm. So no, we're not out here just to um, create, spread our genes, I don't think. Um, I think that that's all that the Darwinian world cares about, but we're not just part of that world. We maybe arose out of it, um, but we've got a lot, we've got a lot more to explore than just that. Yeah. It's kind of like that quality. I'm kind of saying empathy is just this innate quality that kind of the more, I mean, I find it when I empathize with people and connect to people, you know, it's just my well-being. You know, it's it's a matter of my well-being improving. You know, I mean, it's nice that the science is coming out now to kind of explain that. For example, uh, through, as I understand it, through oxytocin, as we connect with others, that the body releases uh, oxytocin, which is like an anti-stress kind of neuropeptide, right? And mm -hmm. we, uh, you know, feel good and, you know, relaxes us and, and so forth. Um, so the other thing I'm kind of wondering about is the ritual part. And so that's kind of like the science part. And how did, how does, how did you kind of get into religion? Are you religious or, you know, you have religious upbringing? What is it about the religion and empathy that is kind of like, kind of gotten you involved? Hmm. Well, that's always a... That's always a tough question, I guess. I, um, I was raised uh, without any particular religion, um, sort of by um, hippies, I guess, new age. New age. So I, I grew up with some new age stuff and some Sufism and sort of various different traditions. Um, I think what interests me about religion is the fact that um, it, religion in many ways, I mean, there's many ways to define religion, right? So if I just use the word religion, I'm just kind of picking one definition. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, what interests me about what I call religion is the way that it gives people tools to respond to the fundamental existential challenges of life. The fact that we're mortal, that we're going to die, and before we do, we're probably going to get sick, we're going to lose family and friends, bad stuff is going to happen, it's going to rain, right? We're going to get, our pets are going to mm. run out under cars, right? There's all these things about life that are really hard to deal with um, for everybody. Um, and that doesn't mean there's lots, I mean, there's also lots of great things about life. Um, but I think that religion gives people a way to sort of extend their sense of what matters beyond just the physical animal, biological world. Mm. So for me, um, if I could put it in a simple sentence, it's almost like religion is a response to Darwinism. Mm. You know, people always think that Darwinian, the Darwinian world or the Darwinian worldview and religion are, are antagonistic and you can't have both. I don't think that's true at all. Not one little bit. I think that if you read through the scriptures of the big world religions, like the Quran, like the Bible, um, like many of the writings in the um, Jewish uh, Talmud, and I think probably even, I, th I think there's probably some support for this in Taoist texts, like the Zhuangzi and the Lao Tzu. 
but especially in the Quran and the Bible, there's a lot of talk about the world, right? Um, stay away from the world. Don't, don't get into it. Don't, or if you do get into it, um, don't let your idea of the world become all that you care about. Um, as far as I'm concerned, what those texts mean when they say the world, capital <coughs> W, is the Darwinian race, the Darwinian, um, you know, challenge. Could it and be? So, oh, could it be uh, kind of this sense of selfishness and self-centeredness? Maybe that uh, I kind of see that as two two kind of qualities that we have inherent. Right? Is is we can connect with others. Um, uh, through a kind of an empathic connection and be kind of connected, you know, with, uh, you know, our family, our community. But the Darwinian is almost like saying, or that approach is saying, it's all about me. It's all about yeah. my struggle for myself. And it's a an inward, it's kind of the greedy, selfish, and it's my struggle. So it's like, it's two capacities that we have as, as biological beings to, uh, you know, disconnect from others and just try to, um, or connect with our cats. <laughs> um, I love it. I'm in the way right now. So, I mean, that's that's kind of how I, how I would kind of, you know, maybe that the Darwinian, if it's like it's all just survival of the fittest, it's just about me and my, you know, selfish, greedy, um, you know, what's kind of working for me. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, the most famous popular book since Darwin's book on uh, the dynamics of evolution has as its title, The Selfish Gene, yeah. by Richard Dawkins. Um, and that really is the, the neo-Darwinian paradigm, which is the way that most evolutionary scientists think that evolution works, is a lot like what you were just describing, where we, everything, like literally everything, is motivated consciously or more likely deeply unconsciously by the drive to propagate our genes. Um, what I think is most interesting about religion and empathy and compassion and ritual and evolution is that the evolutionary view gives us real insight into our behavior. If we think that we aren't motivated by our desire to produce offspring, we're lying to ourselves because most of us have had the experience of walking into a party and being drawn to talk to the most attractive person there. Everybody's had that experience. So to, to deny that we're animals and that we are often motivated by our genetic mandate is, I think, disingenuous. What I think is the right way to respond is to um, engage with what we would call spiritual ways of, of being um, that kind of take the inherent sort of maybe even almost latent capacities for empathy and compassion and the reaching out that you were just talking about and, um, and building on them. So again, I mean, I feel like religion and spirituality are ways to respond to the evolutionary world. Well, it sounds um, like you're... I oh, just came home, so oh. I've got... Hey. Okay, so um, yeah, we can kind of wrap... Did you want to wrap it up? Is that what you're saying or... It's fine with me to continue. I don't know. You'll oh, okay. might have to edit. Oh, I'm good. But no, it just yeah, you know, I'll just be putting this online, so it doesn't. It's no. It's fine. Sounds um, good. It doesn't have to be highly edited. It's um, this is casual dialogue. So, um, so my sense is that you're that for you. It's really kind of this integration. It's like you're trying to like integrate different kind of qualities of life: the science, the religion. Uh, the philosophy, I think you're studying philosophy too, is that right? Or Yeah. 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 So you're kind of, maybe am I getting it right that you're kind of really about trying to integrate all these different qualities of life and I yeah, I would say so. I'd say, you know, it's it's too big of a job for just one person. Obviously, you know, I'm I'm just I'm I'm just a PhD student. I don't mm -hmm. you know. Um, but I think that there are a lot of people out there who are starting to who are realizing that kind of crossing disciplinary boundaries and trying to integrate these different ways of seeing things is really necessary because there's there's real powerful insights into our predicament and our situation as you know human animals on planet earth 
that we can get from biology, from evolutionary science, from psychology, from philosophy, and whether um, we know it these days or not from uh, the teachings of the world's great wisdom traditions um, and even the texts of the Bible and things like that. There's a lot of really, really powerful insight into human nature in the Bible. Well, that, that res resonates uh, with myself as well. I don't know if you, if you kind of look through my website, it's very eclectic. So I really bring all the different traditions, you know, all the different ways, you know, it can be medicine, the arts, um, the science, the religion. It's like anything around empathy, you know, I kind of want to bring it together and kind of bring, uh, I don't know, it's, but it, bring it together and synthesize it in some way. Um, one thing I talking about art, actually, one thing I like to ask people is what their metaphor of empathy is. You know, typically empathy is defined almost is by the metaphor of standing in someone else's shoes and looking through someone else's eyes. Hmm. And that's just like a metaphor. Do you have a metaphor that you could come up with uh, just for yourself? Uh, if empathy is like. And while you're thinking, maybe I can just tell you what mine is. It might help sure. us stimulate. And for me, empathy is like a cornucopia. So each of us as human beings, we have this cornucopia of feelings, values, and qualities inside of ourselves. And through empathy, we kind of can connect to our own uh, cornucopia of all these different experiences, as well as the others, as others. So I'm able to you know, through mirror neurons and, you know, perspective taking, able to see your smile, right? And kind of get us and feel that smile and, and that richness of, of uh, you know, all the thoughts that you've been sharing and, and the stories. So for me, yes, yeah, so that's why empathy is, is like a cornucopia. And so I don't know if, if in the meantime, you've uh, if been inspired to uh, think of one. I don't know if I could come up with a really cool metaphor right off the top of my head, but uh, I, I have thought quite a lot in the past, just actually in the past couple of days, that uh, empathy has a lot to do with patience, um, which sounds like a cliche, sure, right? Patience is good, patience is <coughs> virtue. But I don't think we always know how much we don't see other people because we're seeing kind of how we wish they were um, because people are often, you know, they don't see what you're saying or they're, they don't meet you where you are or they're busy or they're rude or maybe they're almost right for whatever situation you're in, but not quite. I don't know if this happens to other people, but this happens to me all the time where I'll be listening to somebody talk and I'll think like, Oh, if they just knew one more, you know, if they, if, if they were, Seeing if they'd read the same thing I read, then we would have, be having a better conversation. Um, that's kind of a lousy way to interact with people, I think. And, uh, f and for me, allowing things to be as they are and sort of accept, accepting that um, the kingdom of heaven has not happened yet and that we're all super, super imperfect and we don't know a lot about each other, about our own motivations, what's going on inside our own heads. Um, we're all just kind of bumbling around trying to do the best we can. Um, that's that kind of patience for me, allowing our moment in time to just be what it is, is I think really important for empathy. Mm -hmm. If I had a foolproof trick for just um, always being like that, I would definitely share it right now, but I, I don't. I'm, I'm usually in the hurried, um, uh, not patient mode, unfortunately. Yeah. It's like uh, being in a hurry can kind of cut us off from others and and kind of being slower and patient. Maybe we're kind of open more to others. Yeah. Yeah. And there's a lot of, well, there's a lot of, I, this is maybe a, a topic for even a different conversation, but there's a lot of research um, that suggests that certain forms of religious ritual and what we might call meditation mm -hmm. um, and prayer and things like that um, can kind of help us to uh, meet meet things where they are a little bit better rather than how we wish they were. Yeah. So, so you're kind of connecting empathy and, and patience and kind of looking at the connection there. 
um, a, a metaphor would be more of like an image. Yeah, uh, yeah. You know, I'm going to get back to that. So it would be uh, if if empathy was a type of animal or, a, you know, type of land, you know, or, you know, anything, a machine or something like that. That's more of the... the you know, I think I, I think if I... if Here, how's this? I think that empath, empathy is like drawing but doing it well mm. it's the difference between drawing a person's face and just drawing a little circle with two uh you know two circles for eyes and a little dash for a mouth and a little a mess for a hair you just kind of rub your crayon around or draw a marker or whatever it's the difference between that and really paying attention to what the person you're drawing looks like and all of a sudden there's this moment where everything kind of gels and you're no longer looking at something the way you expected it to be, but you're looking at something in exactly the way it actually is. And that's what allows that connection. I think that's my metaphor. Okay, so it's drawing uh, and yeah. kind of being, drawing deeply, kind of a deeply drawn yeah. work of art. Well, yeah, that's that's nice uh, metaphor. Um, it kind of it reminded me of uh, the origination of the word empathy. Uh, I don't know if you looked that up, but it was uh, a German aesthetics philosopher, mm. and it was like the eighteen seventies or so. And he wanted to explain, you know, looking at a work of art. Let's say if you're looking at a Picasso or Rembrandt or something, and when you first look at that painting, you have a certain quality of feeling from that. And the longer, the more patient you are, and the longer you look into it, you start feeling your way into that work of art and kind of mm. more kind of reveals itself. Right. So he wanted to have coin a word to uh, uh, explain that, that phenomenon. And uh, he, the, the word was uh, ein fühlen, which is a German, ein is in, I don't know if you speak German or not. I do. You do? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, you know, it's it's feeling into so feeling your way into uh, of the work of art, and then it kind of got passed around. To, then they started using oh, feeling your way into the experience of someone else, and and so it did. Your your metaphor kind of harkens back somewhat to the origination of the word empathy. That is really cool. <laughs> yeah, naturally comes back to that. It's, um, well, uh, how is it, it, you know, getting kind of looking at it from a personal uh, side, like through your life, was empathy something always important to you? Or is it like something that's kind of like uh, just kind of become of interest through your studies? No, I wouldn't say it's just because of my studies, I think. I, I mean, I, I think empathy is very, very important to everybody, whether they know it or even know the word or, or not. Um, I think people, that's, that goes for people who don't experience enough of it as children and people who are taught how to do it a lot. Um, I, I think that people who suffer from a lack of empathy in, in childhood or in their lives at some point, um, they, it really affects them. It really affects us to have that happen. Um, so I, you know, I, I think that empathic connections with other people um, is a pretty basic requirement for a healthy human life um, it, so is that oh, like sorry. your family you kind of learned empathy from your family they said hey empathy is important it's really important to stand in other people's shoes and uh was it was like a childhood thing that you were taught or you just kind of learned about it as you're kind of going along in life like is there some story of having learned some insight about empathy as you're growing up hmm I'm not sure if I could come up with one story. I would say maybe that the type of upbringing that I had would have maybe had a lot of talk about empathy, um, a lot of conceptual engagement with the, con with the, the idea of empathy. Um, but I'm not sure that that's, you know, that's really enough. I think there's often 
you know, I think you need that and also people, because we're bodies, right? We're animal bodies. We can't just talk about things and have them make sense to us. Empathy is something we do, right? You don't, you're, you're not empathic if you kind of sit there and stare at the floor and listen to somebody talk about their problems and kind of say like, okay, yeah. No, you're empathic when you look at some, look somebody in the eyes and you reach out to touch them when maybe on the shoulder when they're having a difficult time. Um, empathy comes, right? Empathy comes from dancing with somebody, right? You're, you're feeling the motions of both of your bodies together and um, anticipating what the other person is about to do. And so you're, you're kind of moving your own center out, right, from yourself to, to the people around you. So um, I think in... Uh, in some ways, um, uh, just yeah, just ta just talking about empathy or just learning about it um, in a conceptual way is maybe just one, you know, just a very I think maybe even just a small part of of actually learning about empathy. Well, that kind of gets back to what is the definition of empathy, and you know, I've been looking at this for you know some time, trying to integrate the different definitions that. Um, I've come across, and I've kind of come up with a four four part em of empathy. Kind of first being self empathy, which is kind of self awareness, uh, mindfulness. Uh, you know, it's that sensory awareness of what's going on in your body, and kind of a self knowledge. The second part being is uh, would be maybe a mirrored empathy, and, and you know, if you're studying this in in the science. It's typically called uh, effective empathy or emotional empathy. So as you're shaking your head, you know, mm -hmm. in acknowledgement, and it's kind of you're even speeding right. it up a little bit and smiling. So as I'm looking at that, I'm I'm actually feeling it through mirror neurons. I'm kind of like rep replicating it. As you're watching me, you're seeing my hands go all over. you so you're kind of you know picking up that energy. And just to experientially feel that and have a connection to that would be the kind of mirrored empathy, effective empathy. And then the third part is this kind of the, the uh, cog it's called cognitive empathy or almost like an imaginative empathy. You know, it's like the cognitive part, imagining yourself in someone else's shoes, you know, kind of perspective taking. And uh, kind of the fourth part uh, is empathic action, that once we've kind of created a synergy between us and a connection it's taking action together where there's no blocks to the action so uh, if there's like a block it means somehow we haven't really connected there's some kind of a uh, a connection missing an empathic connection and you see that in in mediation for example you know as i've two conflicted parties they're all mad at each other and then you kind of, through empathy, they kind of connect, they kind of come together, and then they take some kind of steps to action to go forward. Mm. Um, so I don't know, I'm just wondering how that uh, definition uh, kind of resonates with your understanding. Yeah, uh, I'm, it sounds good, sounds good. Uh, <laughs> I've, I've, uh, it's, uh, the literature on empathy is, is one I haven't really delved, uh, haven't, had, haven't had the time to delve much into. Um, see the world through other people's eyes. Now, empathy is a quality of character that can change the world. 